Open your Bibles to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. If you need the notes, just hold your hand up. Let me scare you tonight. I think we'll be done early. Every time I think that, it's... Well, we will be done early. One o'clock, two o'clock. We will be done early in the morning. No, not very long tonight, but boy, something that will help you. Trust it will help you. It helps me as I consider it and think about it and prepared for it. Preaching through the book of, or the chapter, Psalm 119, longest chapter in the Bible. Almost every verse has something to do with the Word of God, and it's divided up for each letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and then each section then has, begins in the Hebrew with that particular letter, and each section has a particular thought. And so tonight we're looking about trials and faith. Trials and faith. You're going to have trials. That was going to, the more you try to walk with God, the more you try to serve God, the more you try to be like Christ, the more the devil's going to fight to knock you off. Now, you say, well, I don't want the devil to bother me. Well, then just quit now. Don't quit, though. But that's what you do. Just don't quit. I mean, just don't try anything. Don't try to serve God. Don't try to be faithful. Don't try to pray for anything. Don't try to read your Bible consistently. Don't try to witness for Him. Don't try to serve Him. Just kind of go with the flow, and the devil will pretty much leave you alone. But then you try to do something for God, and the battles will come. And so, looking tonight at the trials and faith, and David certainly one of God's great warriors, God's great leaders, uh, God speaking through him, God taking David through his life so he could give us this word. Do you understand the difference? God brought things into David's life so David could understand what he was pinning down that God gave him that was already established in heaven. And so we sign here David teaching us by what God is te teaching us through him. There at Psalm 119 about trials and faith. So beginning in verse number 81, it's where we are tonight as we head our way through Psalm 119. So think about it as you look at this passage about trials and faith. Verse 81. My soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. Mine eyes fail for thy word, saying, When wilt thou comfort me? For I am become like a bottle in the smoke, yet do I not forget thy statutes. How many are the days of thy servant? When will thou execute judgment on them that persecute me? The proud have dig pits for me, which are not which are not after thy law. All thy commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongfully. Help thou me. They that had almost consumed me upon earth. But I forsook not thy precepts. Quicken me after thy loving kindness, so I so shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. Father, help us tonight as we look at these verses and challenge us, Lord. I, Lord, I just, even as I prayed and looked at this, I know that there's a need for every person in the room because, Lord, I know we have trials. I know we are in a battle for your work. I know we are in the battle for our children and for the next generation. So, Lord, I pray that tonight you would help us to have the faith and glean tonight something that will help us, something to help us from falling away God, I pray you would stir our hearts new and afresh for your word. Again, God, I don't know the need of every person, but you do. And your word can meet that need. So, Lord, please help me be brief as I can. But, Holy Spirit, take your word and apply it like only you can. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. The little subtitle there comes from a quote by Franklin Roosevelt. He said, when you reach the end of your rope, tie a knot in it and hold on. We all picture the idea. Have you ever been to the end of your rope and your word just going to slip right on off? I mean, you just begin to slip down and you begin to slip down and you're holding and it begins to burn your hands and you get to the end and you just finally fall off. Mr. Roosevelt said, no, I said, when you get to the end of it, tie a knot. It gives you something to hold on to. That's what we see, I think, tonight in this psalm. It's the end of your rope and the knot of faith. The knot of faith. Maybe you've never been there yet in your life, but I'm here to tell you if you serve God long enough, you will get to the place where all you've got is you're down at the end of the rope and just holding on to that knot of faith. Your faith that keeps you from falling off. Your faith that keeps you from falling away. Your faith that keeps you from falling into areas you should not go. And we see that, I believe, right here in this psalm. By the way, you've got to have the knot there first, though. 
You've got to have the knot of faith. You've got to have that decided. You have to have those things in place. So when you get down there, you say, oh, this is the end, but all I've got is faith. I believe we see that with David here. Uh, you read through here. It's, not, it's kind of a dark portion of Psalm 119. But we see his trials. We see his heart. But we also see that knot of faith, that hope he has, the challenge that he has. So tonight we need to understand that and looking at it about the faith and patience, the trials, and that's what it is. It's a portion of faith and patience. David, who is a man of faith, a man after God's own heart, but as you read through the Psalms, you know that David struggled still with sometimes his faith. He struggled with his anxiety. He struggled with his disappointments. He struggled with his fears, and yet he had great faith, and yet he held on to the end, yet he distrusted God. And so tonight we must understand, listen, if you get nothing else, understand as we read this psalm that as David had a mixture of anxiety sometimes, a lack of understanding, he still had it mixed with faith for the years. So even as we go through our life, you say, boy, preacher, I'm just, I'm just concerned. Have faith. Well, preacher, I have some burdens. Just have faith also. But there is that mix we have, and sometimes we get to the place where we just have the faith at the end. Turn, if you would, to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Hold your place here, but turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I believe we get the same picture, the same idea here as the Apostle Paul going through his life. David had trials. David had enemies. David had persecutions. David had people after his own life. David had his family problems. He had his own son trying to get him out of uh, the, taking the throne from him, and just on and on it goes, and yet we find David to the very end on his deathbed still praising God and giving direction to his son from God. But we find that we still have those troubles. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and in verse number 8. It says, we are troubled on every side. You can almost hear that when you read that portion of Psalm 119, David talking about having troubles on every side, yet not distressed. He said, we got trouble, he said, but I'm still holding on. We are perplexed, but not in despair. See, we don't have to despair. Aren't you glad you don't have to despair? You can be confused. You can say, I don't know what's happening. I don't know why it's happening. I don't know what we're going to do about it, but I'm not going to despair. Again, that is the idea of that little knot of faith at the end of your rope. Verse number 9, persecuted, but not forsaken. See, when you get persecuted, you don't have to feel like God has forsaken you. You don't have to feel like that God doesn't care about you. Because he's, that's the condition where he, he was. Cast down, but not destroyed. So that concept of, yes, we have trials, yes, we have heartaches, yes, we're going to have difficulties if we're trying to serve God, but we do not have to quit. We don't have to give up on God. We need to hold on to that bit of faith as we find that David here in this psalm. So the key is, in spite of all our fears, in spite of our trials, in spite of your hurts that we will all have, Let's not quit. Let's catch on to it tonight. So very quickly, just by way of introduction, back in Psalm 119, we see in this psalm, let me give you the overview, and then we'll look at some details, and we'll get you home tonight in plenty of time to watch whatever you watch, Bonanza, Lassie, uh, whatever's on. In our trials, are you with me tonight? Trials are coming. In our trials, we can be faltering but hoping. Faltering, but hoping. I think that's in your notes. You say, preacher, I, man, I, just, I just don't know how it's going to be. That's all right, but we still have hope. Hello? We still have hope. I can be faltering. I can be shaking. I can be nervous about things, but I can still have hope. In our trials, we can be questioning, but waiting. Questioning, but waiting. And we're going to see these principles, these truths, as we look at Psalm 119. In fact, uh, look at verse 82. David asked the question. He said, My eyes fail for thy word, saying, When will thou comfort me? He's saying, God, when? When are you going to comfort me? God, I know that you will. I know that you can. Your word promises. In fact, that's what he's saying. He says, My eyes are looking in the word. When will you do it? Do you ever get that place with God? You say, God, your word says this. When is it going to happen? Lord, your word says this. When am I going to have the confidence in that? Lord, your word says this. When am I going to see it? So he asked the question. But he's waiting. It wasn't attackatory, uh, accusing of God, but it was just asking of God. Look at verse 84. How many are the days of thy servant? When? 
will thou execute judgment on them that persecute me? So he's asking the question, but he's waiting. He's asking the question, but he's anticipating. So when our trials come, we can be faltering, but with hope, that faith. We can be questioning, but we've got to keep waiting. In our trials, we can be dying, but reviving. Dying, but reviving. Uh, verse 87. They had almost consumed me upon the earth, but I forsook not thy precepts. Quicken me after thy loving kindness, so shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. He said, they about consumed me. They about eaten me up. He said, yet revive me. So we can feel like we're dying, but being revived at the same time. Isn't that an exciting thing? I don't know if you've ever been there or not. We say, Lord, I'm just dying in this. But the Holy Spirit, then even as we feel like we're dying, He's reviving. Even as we feel like we're going down, we can feel Him lifting us up again. I'm glad we serve a living God. I'm glad we've got the Holy Spirit inside of us that helps us through these trials, through these questions, and through these issues that we have so tonight let's look and see what it means to hold on to faith to hold on to that knot of faith even though we have the trials even though we are experiencing these pressures of our life God knows that we are God knows that we do but he gives us some avenues of some faith a knot of faith if you will to hold on to because I don't want anybody here to falter I don't want anybody here including me to fail I don't want all any of us here to quit at all and so we find David de dealing with that tonight so here we go very quickly notice at ver uh, verse 81 this idea of trials and faith trials and faith the faith that goes along with the trial so let God speak to you in your heart the area that you need and let God speak to you and challenge you and help you. Very quickly, number one, we find fainting but hoping. Fainting but hoping. Look what it says in verse 81. My soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. He said, my soul fainteth. Faint, lose strength, lose energy willed lose lose power lose consciousness talking about fainting falling away quitting sliding away fainting in our spiritual life there are too many people that have fainted there are too many people fainting now in other words, they're just losing the strength. They're losing the fight. They're losing the consciousness. They're losing the focus. They've just fainted away. They've just lost the energy. They've lost the strength. They've lost the desire. They've lost the fire. They've just fainted. I would anticipate that most of us in certain times of our life have fainted in our spiritual walk. We've just gotten weak. We've just gotten tired. We've just lost our strength. We've lost our energy. And so here we find David. He's speaking to us and teaching us. He said, my soul fainteth for thy salvation. He says, I'm looking for you to deliver us. I'm looking for you. To... He said, but my soul is fainting. Too many have fainted. And we will faint if we're not careful. We will faint and just drift off. But he said, my, fa my soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. That word hope talks about, as we've seen before, anticipation. It's not just crossing the fingers and say, boy, I hope I... Uh, when the cake walk, I hope no. It's this anticipation of God's promises. And so it says, I'm fainting, but hoping. So ladies and gentlemen, when you find yourself fainting, losing your strength, losing your energy, losing your zeal in your Christian life, just keep anticipating God to come through. Just keep anticipating God to bring you through. Just keep anticipating God to bring you out of that fainting spell. We faint so easily. So many things in our Christian life can cause us to faint. So many things in our church can cause us to faint. And by fainting, I'm saying we're talking about folks that just drift away, that just lose the focus and lose their place. Very quickly, and this will be the longest point of the night, we're going to see some things that God tells us by His Word that causes us to faint. Things that will cause you and I to faint. And I'm doing this because I want us to recognize those when these things come and you begin to feel yourself faint. Have you ever felt yourself faint? I mean, where you just begin to get queasy, your knees begin to knock, and you begin to just kind of... Am I the only one that's ever done that? It may be something physical, but you just get kind of queasy. I, we, sometimes we'd call it, you know, you get the cold sweats, the hungry, nervous fits, and you just, oh, man, I just, you, don't, you don't think clearly. You get kind of misfocused. You get weak and you, what, 
Christians, we, we'll get that. Things in our life will make us that way spiritually and we'll fall away and we'll not be right. So God gives us some things in His Word about what causes us to faint. So let's very quickly look. He said, my soul fainteth. He says, but I'm hoping. He said, I've got the hope. I've got the faith. So we've got to tie the faith when we are tempted to faint. Very quickly, it's there in your notes, Hebrews 12, 5. We can faint because of chastening of sin. We can faint because of the chastening of sin. Hebrews 12, 5. And it says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. I've met Christians, and maybe you've experienced it, seen it, where, where Christians, they faint. They lose their strength. They lose their energy. They lose their purpose. They lose their zeal. They fall away because God has chastened them. We know the Bible says if we don't confess our sins, that he will chasten us. And so sometimes we'll find ourselves in a sin, and particularly in areas where the chastening is public. See, sometimes God chastens us and it's private. Nobody knows but us and the Lord. A loss of joy, maybe a loss of finances, a loss of certain things, and we say, ooh, God's dealing with me. Sometimes chastening is public. Where the public then sees, where the public knows, and the public sees you being chastened. We've all recognized that in other folks, and I wish sometimes we'd recognize it on our own when that happens. But then that, that comes, and it's that, that chastening of the Lord. And sometimes we, we begin to faint because we get ashamed, because of our pride. We get guilt. We've hurt others. And we begin to faint because of the chastening of the Lord. By the way, God says we're not supposed to hate the chastening of the Lord. We're supposed to rejoice because the Bible says when He chastens us, that proves we're His child. If we do not have the chastening of the Lord, if we sin and do not get it right, and God does not chasten us, the Bible says we're not His. We are bastards. We are not legitimately His children. So we're to rejoice in the fact that He cares enough to chasten us, but at the same time, He says, don't faint. Don't quit. Don't wither. Don't die. Don't run away because God is chastening you. So what do you, we say, preacher, what do I do when I do that? Just keep hoping. Meaning we have the anticipation that when, if I confess my sins, He's faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And that God wants to reestablish relationships with Him and me again. No matter how much sin, no matter what I go, God still wants to reconcile Himself with me. Aren't you glad about that? And certainly David would know that about being reconciled back to God after sin. In fact, we recognize his fainting even after the sin of Bathsheba and things that it just tore him down. But he says, I'm fainting. He says, but I'm hoping. That anticipation. So we faint because of chastening of sin. So let's, first of all, let's live our lives so God doesn't have to chasten us. We try to teach our kids that. Kids say, I don't like spanking. Well, I don't like being grounded. Well, you say, God, I don't want to be chastened. He says, well, let's just do what we're supposed to do. But when we are chastened, he says, do not faint. Do not faint. Number two, we f fainting and hoping. We faint because of chastening. Sometimes we faint because of contradiction of sinners. Because of the contradiction of sinners. Hebrews 12, 3. For consider him, speaking about Christ, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. You say, preacher, what in the world is contradiction of sinners? Contradiction means dispute and or disobedience. Dispute and or disobedience. So if you put that in context, it says, for consider him, Jesus Christ, that endured such contradiction, such disputing, such disobedience, such anger, such resentment, such battling of sinners against himself. He said, you got to, he says, so when, when we begin to have contradiction against us, when people begin to rebuke us, when people begin in sin to despise us, to disobey us or disobey the Lord, uh, he says, he says, don't faint because of that. Don't faint because of the sinners being so ruck, ruckus and don't faint because there's so much against you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're living in a society that that's against Christianity right now. As a whole, it is. You say, oh, preacher, I don't believe that. No, 
you know as well as I do, standing for the principles of the Word of God is not being accepted by the world. And so that disputing, that contradiction of sinners is going to put pressure on us, is going to put pressure on you, it's going to put pressure on our kids as we try to live for God. He says, so when that contradiction comes, when you try to stand for God and the world says, don't you dare stand for God. When we try to stand for holiness and righteousness and the sinners come and say, don't you dare stand for righteousness and holiness. When we try to say, I'm going to be honest and pure, and they say, no, don't you dare try to be honest and pure. When we have that contradiction, that pressure against us, we are apt to faint. God says, don't do that. Don't faint. So how can I do that? Consider him that endured such contradiction. Consider Jesus Christ. Think about him and what he did. Just write this down. It's not in your notes. Matthew 24, 11. Talking about this day. And many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. I believe that's a correlation concept with the contradiction of sinners, the disputing of sinners, the disobedience of sinners, the pressures of sinners against right. Just like it is today, it says, when iniquity abounds, the love of many, the love for Christ, the love for His Word shall wax cold. Fainting, but hoping anticipating God to come through, anticipating by faith God's still in control. You say, preacher, you don't understand. I'm being chastened of God. Yes, but God chastens me to restore me. Yes, God chastens me because He loves me. So I'm just going to have faith even in the fact that I'm being chastened that God does care and God is still working on me. Just keep hoping, even though we are fainting. I forgot what preacher it was. It says, even when we're being spanked by the Lord, we can rejoice in the fact we know His hand is still on us. Amen. Think about that. We can faint because of chastening. Number two, we can faint because of the contradiction of sinners. Number three, sometimes we faint because of concern for others. Sometimes we'll, we'll faint because of concern for others. Ephesians 3.13. It's there in your notes. Wherefore I desire that you faint not. He said, I don't want you to quit. I don't want you to get weak. I don't want you to be faulty. He said, wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. He said, I don't want you to quit. I don't want you to stop. I don't want you to let down because I'm going through tribulation for you. Because I'm going through tribulation on your account. He says, don't quit because I've got trouble. Don't quit because of what you've done and what your church is doing is causing me trouble. He says, don't quit because of that. Sometimes we'll tend to faint, quit, let down because we're concerned of how it's going to affect others. Yeah, we ought to be concerned about others. See, preacher, let me, let me give you an extreme situation. We think of the Colosseum. Renounce Christ and we'll feed your kids to the lion. I'm afraid I'd probably faint. But I'm not sure I can do that. In the Muslim countries today, convert or die. Convert or we'll kill your kids. There's the idea where you faint because of the tribulation, somebody's suffering far because of you. Oh, we are so sheltered as Christians. God says, no, He says, don't faint. So the Apostle Paul says, I desire that you faint not at my tribulation for you. That's why you got to know what God says. See, if I'm standing on what I think, then I'll faint. But if I say, no, this is what God says. This is what I cannot deny the Lord. I cannot deny. And you stand on what He says, then you will not faint. So here He says, we can faint because of the concern for others. Fainting, but hoping. He said, my soul fainteth. He said, boy, I'm hoping. I'm trusting, anticipating in Your Word. Very quickly, we can faint because of circumstances. We can faint because of circumstances. Jonah 4.8 and it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted. There he is physically fainting. He's just wasted away and wished in himself to die and said it's better for me to die than to live. 
I mean, just the circumstances. This is not pleasant. This is not joyful. This isn't fun. This is uncomfortable. This is hot. I am miserable. He said, I'd just rather die than do this. And he fainted. Ladies and gentlemen, we're apt in our Christian life often to get to that same place where we say, you know, I just don't think I want to go on anymore. I don't think I want to continue this anymore. It's just too challenging. It's just too hard. The circumstances aren't right. It's just not as pleasant as I thought. That's when we have to hold on to that knot of faith and say, oh, but I'm trusting in His Word, I'm trusting in what God says, and I'm trusting God knows what He's doing. Just when life gets hard. Has life ever been hard for anybody in here? Yeah, sure it has. But don't faint. Don't faint. I don't know if many people would admit it, but probably many of us have come to that place in our life where circumstances are so hard, we say, I'd just soon die. Just as soon die. It's easy to faint when we get like that with Jonah. Just circumstances. But don't faint. Don't faint. Very quickly, we faint because of the conviction of sin. We faint because of the conviction of sin. Jonah 2, 7. There he is in the belly of the well. He said, when my soul fainteth within me, I remember the Lord. And my prayer came unto thee in thy holy temple. Oh, he said, when I remember the Lord, when I think about the Lord, when I thought about my sin, when I realized how much I fought against God and how I sinned against God, he said, my soul fainted. We've all known folks that have fainted, have dropped by the wayside because they just got in sin. In conviction of sin, our own shame, we don't, we don't want to go on, we just want to falter and we just begin to, to fade away. Very quickly, we faint because of conflicts. Listen carefully. We faint because of conflicts. Proverbs 24.10 If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. God says there's a real temptation, there's a real danger, there's a real opportunity, if you will, for us to faint in the day of adversity. Adversity. I'm talking about just troubles with people, problems with people. Most of us got to the place where we say, I just want to quit because I've got problems with people. That's what happens to marriages. Well, the marriage isn't happy. I've got problems with the marriage. Don't quit. Don't faint. Don't stop. Well, I have problems with my kids. Don't faint. Don't stop. Well, I have problems in the church. There's some people in the church. Guess what? The church is full of problems because it's full of people. So we're apt to faint, to fade away, to fall just because of strife, because of arguments, because of adversity. Don't let somebody else cause you to faint away from God. Don't let, don't, you hear what I said? Do not let somebody else's attitude, our actions, our approach, let you faint or fall away from God. God says that if you faint in those days, He says, your strength is not small. You're a weakling. You're a wimp if you let that happen. So the idea here is that we can faint because of conflicts. There are going to be conflicts. Not everybody's perfect like you and me. There'll be conflicts. But we do not faint. So the idea here back in our psalm is God is trying to help us understand. He said, listen, you're going to have problems. You're going to have some trials. He said, but you've got to have that hope at the end. Again, look at our text. It says in verse 81, My soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. I anticipate in thy word. I grab a hold and hold on to your word. Aren't you glad that when we have these times we tend to faint, we can go right back to the Bible. We can open up God's precious word if you believe it's God's word and God's given it to us and inspired it and preserved it for us. You can say, God is speaking to me and I'm hoping in his word. You say, preacher, what do I do when I'm about to faint? Get in the Bible. What do I do when I'm when I got conflicts in my life and I just don't know what I'm going to do and I think I'm going to fade away and I think I'm going to falter and I think I'm just going to quit? What do I do? Get back in the Bible and claim some verses and claim some principles and claim some promises and don't let the devil pull you away. Well, what do I do when the world pressures me to not stand for the Word of God? Just get more in the Word of God and hope on His Word. David, you got some problems. He said, I sure do. He said, my soul is fainting, but I'm hoping in the word fainting but hoping fainting but hoping number two trials and faith the knot he had the knot of hope here we've got failing but praying failing but praying verse number two my eyes fail for thy word saying when will thou comfort me in other words his eyes are searching for a word a help from the word an answer from the Word. 
He said, my eyes are failing. I, I can't see. They're being wore out. He said, I just, I just, they just fail. That's why the Bible says without vision, the people perish. So just failing. You, have you ever been to the place where you just can't see it? You just can't see clearly? You can't see rightly? He said, what do you do? Same thing. He did pray. For my eyes fail for thy word. Lord, I just can't see an answer. I just can't see any hope. I just can't see. What should I do? Saying, when will thou come for me? Just learn to pray. Just pray. Aren't you glad we can still pray? We often wait till it's too late or till the end to pray, but let's just pray. So here we have him. He says, well, we got some trials. He said, what's his not prayer? Start asking, God, when will you comfort me? God, I'm looking to you. Please, Lord, help me and comfort me at this time. So we've got the failing, but the praying. There's, he's at the end of his rope. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do. My eyes are failing. I just can't see it. He says, but I'm going to pray. I like his prayer. He says, when will thou comfort me? Did you ever wonder when God was going to comfort you? Just write this down. Spurgeon put it this way in one of his sermons. He said, God will comfort us, number one, when we put away unbelief. God will comfort us, number two, when we're finished complaining. <laughs> your parents ever been like that with your kids? When you get done complaining, when you get done crying, we'll deal with it. When we put away the sin that we tolerate, God will comfort us when we fill the duties we have neglected. Very quickly. Trials and faith. Frail and fragile, but remembering. Frail and fragile, but remembering. Oh, he said, I've got some trials, but he said, I've got to remember the truth. He said, my difficulty, my trial, my struggle is that I'm frail and fragile, but the faith that not I'm going to hold on to is remembering. Verse number 83, for I am become like a bottle in the smoke, yet do I not forget thy statutes. Uh, they did not have glass like we have it. The bottle there was the wine skins. It was animal skins. It was leather type skins and when they would put it by the fire and it would begin to get hot and over the time it would begin to just dry out begin to look like my skin a little bit it just begin to dry out begin to wear out begin to get wrinkled begin to get frail fragile would not be able to hold up under the fluids that they would put on the inside and so he said this is what's happening to him he says for i am become he says my life is drying me out my life is making me brittle my life is making me frail i'm not able to accomplish what i would like to be able to accomplish he said that's what my life is doing i've got these trials that i'm becoming like a bottle in the smoke and the heat and i'm beginning to smell i'm beginning to dry out and i'm beginning to whatever you would put in me i would begin to taste like that sometimes we begin to do you ever feel frail and fragile do you ever feel like you're just beginning to dry out you're beginning to be brittle, and that's what God is speaking about here. Old David says, I'm, that's what my life is being coming. Sometimes we become that because age, sickness, and sorrow. But what's his not? He said, when I feel like I'm drying out, when I feel like I'm frail, when I feel like I'm fragile, when I feel like I'm, I'm not going to be used anymore. He said, yet do I not forget thy statutes just remember God's word just remember God's principles well I'm getting old and frail but I'm going to remember God's principles well I'm getting kind of brittle I'm not sure I'm going to be able to hold up I'm not sure I'll be able to do what I need to be doing but I'm just going to remember God's principles I'm glad we can remember the word of God so you feel frail and fragile. Trials are coming. Difficulties are coming. Heartaches are coming. But he said, I've got a knot at the end, and that's my faith in the Word of God. I've got a knot in the end. I'm going to remember God's principles. I'm going to remember God's promises. I'm going to remember what God has said very quickly. Trials and faith. He said, fatigued and frustrated, but waiting. Fatigued and frustrated, but waiting. Look at verse 84. How many are the days of thy servant? When wilt thou execute judgment on them that persecute me? He's asking a question. How many days? How many are the days of thy servant? 
And when will thou execute judgment on them that persecute me? So there's people persecuting him, people causing him a hard time. He's having troubles in his life and trials in his life, and he's having difficulties in his life, and he's beginning to feel frail. He's beginning to feel brittle. His eyes are failing him. He's beginning to faint. He's got all these issues, and he asked God this question. He, you can hear he's fatigued. He's frustrated at what's going on. And he asked the question, how many are the days of thy servant? I, look, I looked at that and I was trying to figure it out and I come up with two answers of what he's trying to ask. He could be asking, how much longer do I have? How many more days do I have? How many more days have I got to serve you, God? He said, My, I'm a, your servant. How many days do I have? How much longer do I have to be available to you? How much longer can I continue on serving you? How many more years can I be used by you? Or he could be saying, and we've all asked this one, how much longer do I have to keep going? How much longer do I have to keep going? Look what it says. How many days? How many are the days of thy servant? When will thou execute judgment on them that are persecuting me? God, are the rest of the days going to be as bad as this one? <laughs> How much longer? How many more days before this gets better? How many more days before the pressure is relieved? How many more days before I can breathe freely again? How many more days uh, before these, these people that persecute me are taken care of? God, how, how, much, how many more days of persecution am I going to have to go through? How many more years of persecution and trials am I going to have to experience? How many more years of this issue I've gone on in my life? How much more years can I go on and can I go on? But what's his answer? I'm going to keep waiting. When? When are you going to do it, God? I'm just going to keep waiting. I'm glad we can wait on God. Frustrated and fatigued, but waiting. The knot there at the end, I'm just going to wait on God. Very quickly, fighting foes, but seeking. Fighting foes, but seeking. We got trials, we got troubles, we got difficulties, but there's a knot at the end of the rope and that faith of what God can do. Fighting foes, but seeking. Verse 85. The proud have digged pits for me, which are not after thy law. All thy commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongly. Help thou me. We find he's fighting foes. He find he's got problems. First of all, we find they're building, they're digging pits, traps, and snares. Do you ever feel like people are trying to trip you up? Do you ever feel like people were, and the devil was trying to snare you, trying to get you in the pit, the pit of despair, the pit of remorse, the pit of sin? We get stuck inside those old pits and we just don't know how we're going to get out. That's what David is saying here. He said, the proud have digged pits for me, a place in a hole for me, a pit in the ground, a hole in the ground for me. Boy, we get stuck. Have you ever felt like you were stuck in a pit? I mean, just down in the pit where there's no hope, there's no water, there's no way to get out. Sometimes you feel like Joseph. Remember Joseph's brothers? Put him in the pit. And the only way he got out was it took him out to sell him. You ever feel like that? Boy, I'm getting out of the pit. And find out you're only in a place worse than you were than when you were in the pit. But he said, boy, I'm fighting. We've got pits of despair, pits of remorse, pits of sin, pins so, so dry, even as Jeremiah was placed in the pit. But aren't you glad there's no pit deep and so deep that God can't lift you out? Do you hear what I said? There is no pit dug, dug deep enough by our enemy that God cannot lift us out. Psalm 40, verse number 2, He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet on a rock, and established my goings. I'm glad. Here we have the psalmist said, Man, they've dug a pit for me. He says, But you know what? He said, I'm just trusting in God. I've still got faith in God. I've still got that. Notice what it says. Help thou me. Help thou me. Boy, his answer was just seeking help. He said, they've dug a pit for me. They're persecuting me unjustly. They're persecuting me. They're lying about me. He said, but his answer is, I'm going to seek God for help. I'm glad that when we're at the end of the rope and we're in the pit and we've been persecuted and we just don't know what else to do, we can always cry out to God for help. Having faith that we have a God on the throne who can and will help. Hebrews 4.15 For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Oh, just cry out for help. I'm glad God wants us to cry out for help. That's what he said. 
that we might find grace to help in time of need. When we're in the pit, cry out to God for help. When we're being persecuted, well, just leave, cry out for God for help. The problem is we don't believe our, our God. We don't believe in the Word of God like we should. We don't have the faith. We don't have that knot of faith when everything else is going. But I know God does not lie. I know God's on the throne. I know He's got the throne of grace. He's asked me to come boldly to find help in the time of need. We need to be just like Simon Peter, going down on the water, walking on the water and going down. Lord, help. Save me. Save me. Notice quickly, trials and faith finished but reviving. Finished but reviving. Notice what it says in verse 87. They had almost consumed me upon the earth. That consumed means gone, dead wiped out, obliterated, out of the picture, complete. When you've consumed something, it's gone. Boston cream pie, it's consumed. Okay? They had almost consumed me upon the earth, but I forsook not thy precepts. Quicken me, make me alive, revive me after thy loving kindness so I can keep the testimony of the mouth. There's a little shiny piece of gold in that. It said they had almost consumed me. Almost. 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 Not quite. That's when you're at the end of the rope when it's almost. Almost too much. Almost consumed. Almost dead. Almost. I'm not suggesting. What I'm saying tonight is when you get to that place where you're at the end of that rope, you say, boy, I'm almost consumed. Focus on the almost. The almost. The almost. have that faith for revival. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There is no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. What's that old expression? Close only counts in horseshoes and grenades? Almost. God... God knows our limit, and He may take us to the limit, but just almost. Just write this down, Psalm 73, 2. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. Psalm 94, 17. Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. Finished. It's over. Almost. Do you ever almost quit? Or at the end of the rope? But notice what we says. He's, he's, he's finished. He's dying, but reviving. Verse 88, quicken me. He said, I've almost consumed. Verse 87, they'd almost consumed me upon the earth. But I forsook not thy precepts. Quicken me. Revive me after thy loving kindness. Notice God's quickening, reviving that day. But the purpose for His revival, so shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. He said, revive me so I can obey your word. Revive me so I can keep living your word. So I can keep the testimony of thy mouth. All back to the word of God. He says, revive me. He said, I, they about eat me up. I was about consumed completely, almost. God, revive me. Revive me so I can keep your word. When you got down to the end of your rope, grab a hold of the knot of faith. David says, boy, trouble, but I got some faith. Let's bow our heads, please.